This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted you're with us. Happy New Year to all our listeners. We hope 2021 is going to be a superb year. But I got to tell you, based on our latest COVID-19 stats, we are going to be in for a very, very difficult January. Why is that? Uh, We had a lot of activity around the religious holidays. We had activity on New Year's Eve. We're fearful of community spread, more positivity cases, and unfortunately, probably more hospitalizations. Well, you've been telling us that all week on Dallas-Fort Worth Media, and the hospitals are getting to a real crisis situation. So we're going to talk to the president of the Dallas County Medical Society, Dr. Mark Casanova. And we wanted to get him to help us set the tone for 2021 while COVID is still amongst us, but hopefully, hopefully not for long. Well, I think it's it's seemingly a straightforward message, but we understand that in life, nothing is as straightforward as it, as it uh, could always be. But uh, the simplest way I can summarize it is that masks are effective at mitigating the spread of COVID-19 and therefore at acquiring COVID-19. Another way you could put it is masks save lives. When we've done, uh, from the very beginning, a a deep dive into these cases, and especially in the time frame after which the utilization, the effectiveness of masks became apparent, and of course, CDC came out with those recommendations, what we've seen are that we've talked about the COVID commandments, wearing your mask, washing your hands, and watching your distance. And there are many individuals who engage in that, but if they let their guard down, uh, if they convene in a congregate setting, and that can be, you know, at a restaurant, unmasked eating, in a break room, unmasked eating uh, with coworkers, or even in a family home or the home of a friend with other individuals. Uh, and a common theme here, as you get it, is unmasked and eating or enjoying libations. There's a significantly higher probability that those individuals will uh, acquire COVID-19 if they're around somebody who is, in fact, a carrier. And one of the greatest struggles is that asymptomatic transmission, the fact that individuals have some of their highest viral shedding a full two days leading up to the first demonstration of symptoms. So you can be at that family gathering in that work break room or maybe even just in close proximity to others and not even realize that you're shedding uh, a large amount of viral inoculum. And of course, if you're on the receiving end of that viral transmission and you yourself are not wearing a mask, that's just the greater likelihood of of the risk of, of passing COVID-19. So that's one of the themes that we've seen, not just borne out in the data analysis and tracking and tracing of individuals in our region, as well as across the nation, That's what we see unfold in real life, that when we're visiting these individuals, they will tell you almost to a person, this is how I got it, this is how I know, Um, these were the circumstances, and with an extraordinarily high probability, it was a circumstance when they weren't wearing a mask. And I think that's so important to you because you know, you do have folks who still nine months going on 10 months into this journey may not have the highest of faith or belief in masks and mitigation techniques, but you also have folks who, who generally are compliant. You know, they, they wear their mask every time they're at the grocery store or um, when somebody, you know, delivers their food at the front door. But the problem is, is all it takes is just one slip up, one interaction with individuals who are outside your home to acquire this extraordinarily unpredictable virus. Dr. Casanova, we know that wearing masks works. The science is there. We've talked about it on this show. And yet when we drive past malls and other areas where people congregate, they seem to be full, and we know not everyone is wearing a mask. What are your thoughts on that? If you look at our infection curves with the state of Texas, and you go back to July, and you see that really large spike that was heading up, 
and then you see that uh, hump in the curve and it starts to uh, head down. And if you draw an arrow, you can draw an arrow to the state's mask mandate. And, and, and that can be mimicked at other states as well. So you, when you look at the institution of mask mandates, you see that uh, initial effectiveness. And I think we did have general buy-in in the beginning. The problem was, was that months went by and this notion of, well, I wear my mask when I go to the grocery store, um, and so therefore I'm okay, I think got the best of us to a certain extent. And we began to relax those measures and really weren't thinking about uh, or maybe consciously aware of the risk of gathering together with family members and friends. And because we were maybe doing it piecemeal all along and we felt, hey, this is working okay so far. You know, going back to another interesting data analysis in the study where we looked at folks who had known uh, COVID uh, positivity and had asked them, you know, uh, where do you think you got it or, or what, uh, what were some of the things that you engaged in? For those that were COVID positive that, that could recall uh, a distinct uh, encounter, uh, they were two times more likely to have said, yes, I'm still partaking in eating indoors in a restaurant or at a bar. For those individuals, it's really interesting who said, listen, I don't know how I got it. I can't pinpoint the event. That group of individuals were four times more likely to have had been going to restaurants or bars with some degree of regularity as opposed to the control group. They just couldn't pinpoint which trip to the restaurant or to, to the bar um, that they could they could identify that. And I want to make one important point, which I, I think we don't often do uh, well enough. And that is that when it comes to, to trying to halt viral transmission by any means necessary, wearing masks, avoiding those congregate settings, healthcare's recommendations are focused on the virus being the enemy. Okay, the virus being the vector of harm, morbidity, and death, not to mention the economic impact it has on our society and small business owners and restaurants and bars. It is not, however, the restaurants and the bars that are our enemy. Uh, it's not those physical structures. Uh, many of us enjoy those establishments in which we could still partake in them and look forward to the day when we can again. The reality is it's the human nature and behavior patterns that occur in said establishments that give rise to the viral transmission. So no matter how much we want to will it away and say, well, I'm going to you know, force COVID to bend to my will – it's just not going to work. So we do not want the message to be uh, to those listeners who may run a restaurant or a bar or employed at one or own one that, gosh, you know, the healthcare community is just really down on us. No, that's not the case at all. Um, we do wish that we could support y'all in any way we can, but the best way to support it all is to get control of the virus and as quickly as possible return to some semblance of normalcy. It's also why I encourage folks, order takeout, uh, get drive through food service, certainly support our small businesses and our restaurants. When we come back on the human side of healthcare, Dr. Mark Casanova, who is the president of the Dallas County Medical Society, is going to join me in putting on some COVID glasses. That's right, we're going COVID hunting. You won't think of COVID the same after you hear this. That's next on the human side of healthcare. This is the human side of healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. And welcome back. We're going to do something a little bit unique in this segment. We're going to put on some COVID glasses and go COVID hunting around DFW. And where do you think we'll find some? But first, Steve Love continues his conversation with Dr. Mark Casanova, who is president of the Dallas County Medical Society, talking about flu season this year. Let me ask you this. One positive that I've heard, but I'd like to get your take on this, but I've talked to some healthcare clinicians that have told me one of the positive things of people wearing masks is thus far the influenza has not been that serious this year. What's your take on that? 
Oh, you're absolutely correct. It, it's crickets on the flu front, and knock on wood, that that stays the case. Uh, and and there was a lot of anticipation and expectation early on that we were likely, at least hoping, to see uh, a mitigated flu season, and that appears to be uh, the case. And we were seeing it already in the Southern Hemisphere uh, as it was working its way around the globe. It was just simply not as robust uh, a flu season, Um, again, emphasizing as of yet. But we do believe it makes perfect sense that a critical mass of individuals wearing masks on a regular basis when around each other should absolutely also halt the spread of seasonal influenza. How much COVID is out there? In other words, if we had magic goggles that we could put on and go out there in public, go to the gas station, go to the store, just do our normal things that we do, and we could see all the COVID, what would Mm -hmm. it look like, do you think? Scary. Um, Oh, gosh, how would I describe it? Um, it, 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 if they were snowflakes, we would not be a whiteout, okay? It, it wouldn't be a blizzard, uh, but it wouldn't be a, a North Texas dusting that we get every couple of years, right? There would definitely be snowflakes falling, though, uh, with at least some modest degree of, of transmission. You know, the analogy I use in, in what has happened to us and why the fall and going into the winter is so bad and why also those spikes in the summer were so vicious is with viral illnesses uh, and pandemics, they require uh, priming of the pump, okay? So back in March, at least in our neck of the woods, the virus didn't have strong foothold. So if you if you put on your COVID peering goggles, you would just see, you know, little dots here and there, one little snowflake here and there randomly. But it's entrenched. It has a very strong foothold. So if you if you step into the fray, so to speak, uh, then there's a really good chance you're running the risk of, of acquiring it. Uh, it's almost like a, you know using a World War One battle analogy, and you know two companies of men uh, separated by a no man's land and in, in, in trenches. If you pop your head out of that trench right now with the amount of viral transmission there is, there's a good chance you're going to get hit. Back in the spring, you probably could have made it all the way to the other side of no man's land to the uh, other enemy's trench. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't pop my head up right now. And I think many of us are, are seeing that. When I say us, uh, us, the public, <laughs> just uh, individuals in the sense that our COVID degrees of separation um, have significantly shrunk, meaning knowing somebody intimately or personally that has had COVID or, or in some instances has died of COVID. Early on, it might have been, you know, seven, eight degrees of separation. And now I gather that there are a lot of individuals out there that that degree of separation is down to three at most. And for many of us, it's a single degree of separation. Let's keep our glasses on for a couple of more questions because you brought up sure. some things that need we need to drill down on. So when you're talking about it snowing, is it snowing outdoors or just indoors? Great point. <laughs> it's a strange weather phenomenon this year. It's snowing indoors. Now, having said that, there, it's not as though we should assume that outdoor transmission is not possible. We want to emphasize earlier when I said generalities, generally speaking, outdoor activities are better than indoors. Um, so if your outdoor activity is you and your family going for a bicycle ride or a walk in the neighborhood, totally fine. If it's uh, a walking group that you're going to engage with and be shoulder to shoulder with some neighbors or other people, you should wear a mask. Outdoor eating, safer than indoor eating, Um, but depending on position and uh, being unmasked and somebody having a very vigorous cough within close proximity, you stand a chance of acquiring the infection. So I think the take-home message is it should not be uh, misconstrued that the virus does not transmit outside. It certainly can, but your greater risk is indoor activity, particularly with prolonged engagement and, and really prolonged engagement according to the CDC now is 15 minutes. You know, with tuberculosis, we talk about, you know, being in the same room with the other individuals who's coughing for hours. With uh, COVID-19, it's 15 minutes or less if it was just a really vigorous um, uh, inoculum or exposure. So mostly snowing inside, some flurries outside. 
And on that theme, I'd like to separate. We've had so much conversation about the masks, but let's separate the air from the surfaces. So if we go into the stores now, you and I are taking a little tour and we both have these magic glasses and we go to a grocery store or we swing in to fill up the car on the way to the box store. These places where we go and where every parking lot is full, what would we see on surfaces and is surface contamination still a problem? Well, so it's interesting. What we're going to see right now is probably much less surface contamination with COVID. Fewer snowflakes. They're hitting and they're melting or they're just not they're just not landing and sticking. So kind of classic Texas snowing pattern or or at least Dallas snowing pattern. And part of that is why? Masks. So surface contamination uh, or spread uh, the uh, uh, fomite spread, which is, you know, a hard surface, a doorknob, is proving uh, not to be as great an extent of, of transmission as we initially feared. I mean, gosh, everybody was bringing home their groceries and wiping them down with uh, wipes when they still existed. Um, that's probably not as necessary now. Uh, if, if we're going to do something that is effective and scientifically based, it's wearing the mask. Um, is it wrong to wipe things down? No, of course not. And you do want to actually clean those high touch surfaces. But I think part of the issue is, is we, we have become very aware and cognizant of that. I know when I go to my grocery store, they got a crew in the front and we're always wiping down the, the baskets and, cleaning uh, with regularity. So I think we would see less in terms of threat of transmission that way uh, than if you were in a place where you, you looked in the door, you peered in the window, and you saw that everybody was standing around without masks. Uh, that's a situation I would run away like my hair was on fire. Okay, excellent. That's a great graphic visual that we can lock onto. So thank you for that. We can now remove our glasses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I want to ask you two little lightning round questions because I want to get sure. back to Steve with the other topic. So just two quick things. First of all, is takeout safe? So, or can it be transferred to the food and the containers? <laughs> You know, we, we, it was again, initial fear when we thought that fomite spread was a strong uh, component of this viral transmission and it just not, does not appear to be. So takeout is safe, does not appear to be uh, borne out in food transmission. So uh, those aspects are certainly safe and encourage folks to support your favorite restaurant in that capacity if you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do want to keep these places in business for sure. Yes. And to that end, as we're thinking about safety, you mentioned restaurants and bars. We've got that. Are there any other venues that are the quote unquote hottest right now? Yes, but not necessarily venues that we as general uh, members of the public would uh, engage in. Um, And they include, unfortunately, our long-term care facilities or nursing homes and the like. Uh, There are still problems with with outbreaks. Uh, We've uh, been aware of outbreaks in uh, our prison systems uh, at large, again, across the nation. Um, And unfortunately, we're also seeing some of the um, food processing areas uh, creep back up again. They uh, we're certainly in the news in the spring and summer uh, with massive uh, amounts of spread, just given that physical proximity to each other. So again, you know, it's you really do need the trifecta. You need the masking, very key, but you can't say, okay, we're going to mask, but be right on top of each other. Um, you sure as heck can't be right on top top of each other if you're not masked. Uh, and then if you're in an enclosed space, well, you just bought yourself all the necessary ingredients for uh, for having a problem. And again, remember, just briefly back to the restaurants and the, and the bars, it's not those establishments, it's what we do in those establishments. And what we do is put things in our kisser. And it's really hard to do that with, with a mask on. So that's, you know, you, you, it doesn't take a lot of extrapolation to look at that behavior pattern and say, okay, there you go. That's, that's, that's the, the, the secret uh, is, is the masking. Thank you, Dr. Casanova. We appreciate your thoughts to help get the year started. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. John Carlo. He's president and CEO of Prism Health North Texas, been on the show before. And he is going to talk to us about the new vaccines that are out. Give us an A to Z of what's going on with those. That is next here on the Human Side of Healthcare. Also, check out our podcast. It's on all your favorite podcast players. 
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. Welcome to the human side of healthcare. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about vaccines, and we thought it would really be good for our listeners to get the very latest. We're delighted we've got Dr. John Carlo with us. Many of you know that John is president and CEO of Prism Health North Texas, but he also is very active in the Texas Medical Association and is on their COVID-19 task force. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. You know, as far as the work you're doing at the Texas Medical Association that we refer to as TMA, what is kind of some of the roles that you're playing and how is that overlapping with the really good news about the vaccine. Sure. So the the TMA represents about 50,000 physicians in the state. And, you know, our role in the COVID response and being on the committee is to make sure we do as best we can and making sure our physicians are aware of the latest information. And as you know, right now, there is just so much out there uh, and things are moving so quickly. So we think that it's really important to try to digest that information and provide, you know, the best information as, as we know it and as quickly uh, as we can get it out there to our physicians. Because ultimately, you know, they need to know kind of the latest information so we, we all can do the right thing for our patients. You know, Dr. Carlo, we recently lost Jolly Pride. We just lost a Republican that won a congressional seat in Louisiana. There are many people that have died to COVID-19. So candidly, we're all wondering, is this vaccination safe? Right. And, you know, first, I, I would say, you know, we, we've lost too many, uh, just like Charlie Pride and, 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 and everyone else and in this community. So we know we're, we're in a, a very, very difficult and troubling time. And, and we're, we're really in, in the middle of this, you know, and this is an unprecedented development um, and uh, creation of a vaccine that has really shown that it's not only safe, but also effective. And so to your question, Steve, you know, we look at this from a very, very standardized approach that looks at the study of a vaccine. And we've had over 40,000 people just on the Pfizer vaccine who have uh, volunteered to participate in the study. And we've watched for not only any side effects or anything like that, but also how well it works. And so, you know, as we've been listening to the reports with the good news, the, the studies that show a lot of people have already gotten the vaccine and have shown that it works really well. Um, and then it's also proven to be incredibly safe. So, you know, the good news is we have a, a, a relatively large population that has um, demonstrated that information for us. You know, Dr. Carlo, if you've had COVID-19, still have symptoms, should you wait to get the vaccine until you have no symptoms? You know, that's a great question. There'll be some specific guidance on that, but I think the the appropriate uh, recommendations that I've seen, at least now, you don't want to take the vaccine if you're in the recovery uh, of the infection itself. You know, certainly you don't want to have fever. You want to be well, really, for any anything. So you really want to be... Um, you know, don't want to have any symptoms when you're, when you're ready for the vaccine. But as far as um, whether, number one, should you get the vaccine if you have uh, had a coronavirus infection? I, the answer is yes. Um, and the, the reason is that, number one, is we don't really know how long your antibodies will last that you have uh, developed as a result of that that infection. Um, we will know that uh, the, the antibodies developed from the vaccine will have a specific time period, and we'll, we'll figure that out together as we go forward. But with the uncertainty around an infection and how long those antibodies would last, uh, I would go ahead and get the vaccine. And there's certainly the other thing is there's no risk or harm uh, if you had have had an infection to go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, the last thing I, I would suggest and, and sort of say is that, you know, not every coronavirus infection is the same and not all of them have been diagnosed with tests that are 100 percent accurate. So the other scenario is that you might have thought that you had coronavirus infection, but you turned out it didn't. That wasn't what you had. 
Um, but now, you know, if you decided to not get the vaccine, then you wouldn't have protection. So those are the reasons I would look at if making that decision, if that is the scenario um, that somebody's facing. If someone gets the first dose and they think, oh, that's probably pretty good. I don't need the second dose. Your thoughts? Yes, absolutely not. No, um, you know, the way these studies are running and when we're looking at how well uh, the vaccine works, it, it does show for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine that you do need two doses to get that 90 percent effective level. And that, you know, that's that's very, very critical. Um, and, and not only that, you cannot mix and match. So if you receive the Pfizer vaccine on dose one, you have to have the Pfizer vaccine on dose two. Uh, you cannot interchange the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine um, for the between the first and second dose. And, you know, we don't know to the degree of protection. So in other words, it's, it's very critical to follow the exact guidelines on that time frame because we would not even want to deviate more than a week between the 28 days, for as an example, between the first and second dose, um, because all the studies really show that that protection level is, is really about 14 days after that second dose. So that's absolutely critical to get both and, and not forgo the second dose. Absolutely. You know, you bring up a really good point there, John, that I think is important to our listeners. Even after the second dose, it's going to be about 14 days for it to be effective. So you really should continue to wear masks and do the kind of things that you've been doing all along uh, until we get herd immunity. Is that a correct assumption on my part? That, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, I, I think that it's even beyond that. I, I think that the way I look at the vaccine is it's an incredibly important, um, you know, tool, uh, weapon that we have to fight this pandemic. Thank goodness we have it. It's coming our way. We're, we can't get it soon enough. But, you know, we still are going to have to continue to do the other measures, uh, especially until we get a substantial number of people uh, covered with the immunization. And so, you know, I, I think it's a way to look at it from probably a sense of some security of getting that vaccine. But I would one for not I would not change, you know, wearing a mask in, when going out in public. Uh, just because you receive the vaccine. I think we're going to have to continue to do those physical distancing measures until not only until we get the vaccines out, but also that we have enough people covered with the vaccine so that the community's risk uh, goes down substantially. I think that's really, really critical. Do you know, and it could be too early to really tell, is this vaccine truly uh, a vaccine like when you get a measles vaccine, or is this going to be something similar to the flu shot where we're going to have to do it annually? Oh, that's a great question, Steve. I, you know, I think I'll, I'll hedge the bet and say it's probably going to be somewhere in between. As you know, the flu vaccine, we have to take one every year because influenza, the influenza virus changes year over year so significantly that that vaccine just simply doesn't offer the protection because the virus looks so differently from one year to the next. Uh, coronavirus, at least this one, does not appear to have that same degree of change, um, but we don't know how well it, it does change. And so we don't know the answer to the definitive question of whether or not additional vaccines would be necessary uh, booster doses, you know, we, we certainly hope not, but certainly possible. Um, and you remember even the measles vaccine, the, the MMR, we, we had to add a, a booster somewhere in the, in the late 80s as well. And so, you know, there, there are um, examples where we, we do have to go back and add additional protection, uh, certainly when um, the studies show that that's, that's the right thing to do. You know, John, as a physician, what message would you give our listeners? We all know that there are vaccines, especially for children, where many parents uh, push back and say, I don't want to vaccinate my child, etc. If you could get a message to our listeners about COVID-19 vaccines and your philosophy on it, what would it be? You know, I would say first that Vaccines in general, and, and I think I will quickly include the coronavirus vaccine, especially how exceptional it is 
and how quickly we've we've gotten this new innovation. But vaccines as a whole is really the greatest public health success in, in human history. Uh, if you look at all of the things that we can do in terms of healthcare, all of the the lives we save every day, all of the great work that our healthcare workers do on the front lines every day, the greatest success and reduction in death has been the vaccines. It's the only thing that we've done to conquer diseases as the whole, like we don't have smallpox on our planet anymore thanks to vaccines. Uh, we have childhood illnesses that are almost non-existent thanks to vaccines. And so I believe that the, this is just an incredible success that we recognize and safe. You know, I think the other part is we look at how many millions and millions of people receive that the vaccines every year. And just that high degree of safety is a remarkable achievement. And we're really proud to have it. And I think the coronavirus vaccine is going to be added to this list of successes very, very quickly. Um, you know, I think it has gone very quickly into production, but I think it's also been studied uh, the way we typically look at studies, looking at what we call case control trials and looking at, you know, all the different kinds of individuals that might uh, present differently and have, you know, higher likelihoods or lower likelihoods of coverage. And, you know, so all of those things put it into the category of being the same, just like our other vaccines, which are really are our greatest success. Dr. John Carlo, he is president and CEO of Prism Health North Texas, joins us in our next segment to take on some of North Texas prominent questions about the vaccination. And what about the fact that we don't have a long history of testing? That and much more. And if you missed some of this interview or with Dr. Casanova, check out our podcast. It's on all the major podcast players. It's called The Human Side of Healthcare. We'll be back right after this on 1080 KRLD and radio.com. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co-host Thomas Miller. And we're continuing our conversation from the last segment with Dr. John Carlo. He is President and CEO of Prism Health North Texas. We're talking about these new COVID vaccinations that are out and being distributed even now and wondering, Dr. Carlo, how do they work in our bodies? You know, the vaccine is, is a simple, it gets the body an opportunity to create defenses against whatever this pathogen, virus, or bacteria. It gives it the opportunity to develop those defenses without actually being exposed to it in the first place. It's in simplistic form, what it does is it introduces some component. It's not the whole component, obviously, but it's some piece that basically tells the body to start ramping up antibodies uh, and have them ready if and when the body does become exposed to the actual infection. So it, it's very simple uh, in terms of the strategy. Uh, now, it's incredibly complex in terms of how you present to our immune systems effectively to get those antibodies correct. Um, but that's really, it's, it's simple form, but it's also very complicated in getting it done. Should people be concerned with this name that we don't understand, messenger RNA? That sounds a little spooky to some of us. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think we, we do recognize it's new. Uh, this is not a um, typical delivery mechanism for how, again, as I say, you know, how you can introduce, you know, something to the body so it develops its its immune system to it. But I think that the, the application has been discussed for a long time in concept, um, and I think that it's it's proven safe through the studies so far. You know, we will continue to learn more um, and be very, very watchful for any signs uh, that there may be something we need to, to um, look at. And, you know, as a reminder, um, if not the MRS, mRNA vaccines, uh, we have two coming down the pipeline that will be uh, non-mRNA vaccines. So, you know, we haven't put all our eggs in one basket, which is which is great, I think, overall. Um, and so, you know, we'll be able to look at all of these different vaccines that are coming up very quickly and see, you know, if there's any differences in safety or efficacy. And I, I think that gives us a lot of flexibility and thankfully so. Um, I think that's our best defense to get this pandemic away from us. How will those non-mRNA vaccinations work compared to the to the RNA vaccination? 
You know, they're very similar in the concept. You know, again, what what the mRNA is, it's messenger RNA, and it's simply a way to uh, package and deliver to our immune systems, you know, just a fragment, something that, that the body can look at and say, I know what this is. I'm going to make antibodies in case I ever see it again, and I'll be ready. The uh, other type of vaccines are using a different vehicle, if you will, to deliver that critical piece of information to our immune system. So th- this is, it's called an adenovirus vector, which is really the same thing. It's, it's just the packaging and what is carrying that, that vital, you know, sort of piece of information to get our immune systems programmed, if you will, and ready uh, if and when we are ever exposed to the real thing. Now, what about mutations? Well, and and that's the great question. So the beauty of our system, which is introducing ourselves to something so we can defend it later, uh, the weakness is if it's something that changes, then that defense hasn't hasn't developed yet. So if there is a mutation and it's beyond um, what our antibodies are capable of defending, you know, the option would be to adapt the vaccine itself to accommodate that mutation, something that we do, you know, every year with with influenza. Um, But it is possible that, you know, some of these targets that we look at for vaccines in general, they aren't impacted by the virus's mutations. In other words, there's something that's so typical but can't be changed in the in the in the virus itself that it won't have the capability to make that that disguise or mutation. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see, you know, if it is something that is a mutation, we we'll probably have to change our approach and the formula as well, which we'll be able to do. Another thing that's been in the public conversation really all the way since the vaccination has been mentioned is, well, we won't have any long-term studies on it. Obviously, that's correct. We've got one year, not three, not five. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I think that is important to know that, you know, we, we won't have as much time as certainly uh, if you look at all of our other vaccines, we certainly have taken a lot more time to, to look at that. You know, we're certainly in the middle of a crisis where we're seeing, unfortunately, far too many people um, suffering right now and in, in dying from coronavirus. So we, we have to, you know, take that that risk, if you will, of unknown around the long term consequences with the uh, direct impact that we're having right now. Uh, as well as the inability really to make any any, any changes from where our, our um, pandemic is heading without having this vaccine. Uh, this this is an ongoing study as we go through this together, you know, and so um, any sense of changes or things that don't look right, you know, the one thing I've got to say from, from what we've seen so far, the slightest inclination that something is amiss, we'll hear about it very, very quickly around the world. It's amazing now, which is the information. If you look at what happened in the UK last week with, you know, the the two cases with uh, allergic reactions, you know, it's just an example that we're going to have data and information in real time to make some decisions if we have to. And then how do you see it being rolled out in Texas, but particularly in the Dallas-Fort Worth area? Well, that that's the, the, the big question. You know, as we're seeing this week, the big initial shipments are going to our hospitals. We are really uh, making sure that our critical healthcare workers on the front lines who are taking care of our sickest individuals are going to get first in line. And, and thank goodness for that. And it, it couldn't be happening quicker. You know, our next phase is to focus on high risk individuals that are uh, extremes of age or medical conditions in congregate settings such as nursing homes. So those are the real big push that we're going to focus on now. The next phases for Dallas is going to be down the list of these, you know, priority groups and workers, you know, our community health care workers, uh, the health care workers on the front lines that are not perhaps in the ICUs or in the hospitals still playing an important part every day taking care of our patients. We're going to have to cover them as well. And, you know, as we get through these groups, the list gets longer and there's more people that are in those those populations. And so we're hoping as we get more vaccine, you know, as this goes, as we go through this together, we're going to have more vaccines available so that those next groups are going to have access to vaccines. And I, I, I think that, you know, once we get out of this initial phase with these these essential workers, the hard part begins uh, because we're going to have more people that are now eligible. Logistically, it just adds up that we're going to have to give out more vaccines. And, 
you know, those are some challenging times that we have ahead of us. Uh, I think the good news is we have a lot of community health groups like our organization, Prism Health North Texas, that's ready to give out vaccines. And I think we'll get through it together. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a, a drawn out process and there will be uh, challenges along the way. But I'm I'm at, I'm at least encouraged where we are now and, and thankful that we have uh, these initial vaccines arriving this week. That's fantastic and so encouraging. Talking about personnel, is this something that the medical community can handle or will it uh, require additional resources and entities to help distribute this, especially as you get into those bigger numbers? You know, I, I think that that's absolutely critical to, to make a point. You know, we, you know, as a group, the medical community doesn't exist by itself. The, the, we are not alone, uh, thankfully, in a, in a community such as, as North Texas. And, you know, when we say medical community, that, that involves a wide space of, of different people from different organizations. And, you know, t- taking it from the logistics of, you know, moving the shipments around with our UPS and, and FedEx partners to our logistics experts to our shipping people our our pharmacy teams that are on the ground and so it is a large army of people that it's not just your uh vision of perhaps a typical healthcare worker on the front lines it is much bigger thankfully um i think we're going to have to be innovative in our process and and you know thankfully we have history with this and in 2009 i was the the health director at, at the county health department and we we opened up uh, vaccine clinics in churches, uh, schools, uh, different places in the community. And I think we have a, a plan for something like that. You know, we have to also look back with our polio campaigns in the past where we did a tremendous number at a very, very quick amount of time. So we have history. I think we need to build on that. Um, and I do think it's going to take some some innovation um, and some new ideas to really get this effectively out for a community this large. Thank you, Dr. Carlo, for that great information. We will be keeping you updated through the weeks and months ahead as this story unfolds. Next week, we're going to be talking about the keto diet and intermittent fasting. Do they work? Find out next week on the human side of healthcare.